All right, so I'm going to uh, read an excerpt from uh, John Tolland's Adolf Hitler biography. So John Tolland uh, was a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Um, uh, he won that prize for The Rising Sun, which I believe was about uh, Japan during World War II. Um, and John Tolland, uh, he was, do, 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 I believe he was a Yale professor. Um, and yeah, the biography is really good. It's a very, seems very re well researched. I mean, it was written... Oh, geez. I think in the 60s. Let me, let me find when this was written. Oh, no. My bad. Uh, 1976. Um, and it's a well-regarded biography of uh, Adolf Hitler, but it also includes a lot of information about um, other people in Hitler's milieu. And he gives, like, really good descriptions of these people, how they were in person. Um, and so I found it very helpful for, you know, uh, historical purposes and buttressing my historical knowledge, but also um, for typology too, for like, you know, typing these various characters. Um, and so towards the end of the book, um, when it's kind of talking more about the, the Holocaust and the, uh, the SS's involvement in that, uh, it gets, he devotes a section just to giving a rundown of Heinrich Himmler and his kind of personality and who he was, um, what he was like to be around. So um, I just figured I would actually read it and maybe give some commentary. And this is really, I'm only doing this in light of typology, typological purposes, um, and uh, the actual you know, historical details and whatever you, whatever you think about, um, Himmler isn't really as important. I'm just using his, him as, as an example of a type. So let me begin reading. Um, so <laughs> he starts off the section with a little quote from William Blake, uh, cruelty has a human heart. There is no more paradoxical figure in the higher reaches of National Socialism than Heinrich Himmler. He impressed many by his charm and politeness, his modesty at meetings, his reasonableness. So right off the bat, okay, that's giving me an impression of second volition or possibly fourth volition um, because he impressed many people so it's a it was opinion that was widely held and it was quite um it was a strong it was a strong uh behavior okay um charm and politeness modesty and reasonableness diplomats described him as a man of sober judgment and the resistance movement regarded him as a soul leading nazi who could be utilized in ending hitler's rule Okay, so people regarded him as reasonable and of sober judgment. So already from that, yes, I'm I'm getting really uh, right off the bat. I, I got second volition vibes from that, um, and it's not that again. Remember, second volition isn't necessarily good. I mean, look at Heinrich Himmler, right? He's <laughs> widely regarded as a pretty terrible person, right? But this is this is something that I've noticed with second volition types, and it's a really good way of of pinpointing two V is when someone's a villain, you know, at least in the people's eyes, they're objectively a vill villain, but they still come across favorably. They still come across as someone who's diplomatic and honorable. To me, that's a that's kind of a sure sign of, of second abortion. But we'll continue here. And I'm also getting honestly a little bit of the fact that it's a, so, a man of sober judgment and reasonableness. I'm I'm seeing a little bit of logic, possibly one out creeping in there. So let's let's continue here. Uh, to General Hosbach, he was the Fuhrer's evil spirit, cold and calculating the most unscrupulous figure in the Third Reich. So right there, cold and calculating. Again, giving me an impression of 1L with emotion pushed to the bottom. So emotions third or fourth, 
okay? That lack of warmth, that cold calculating figure, you know, reasonable, but with a lack of like warmth, that to me is higher logic, lower emotion, okay? Uh, to Max Amon, he was a kind of Robespierre or witch-burning Jesuit. So right there, I, you know, Robespierre, Afanasi have typed him as a B-L-E-F. Okay, and a witch-burning Jesuit, I mean, you know, Rob and Absolute Psyche uh, nicknames the V-L-E-F an Inquisitor. So that's kind of interesting. That part right there, that kind of made me think, hmm, maybe I'm going in the wrong direction with the, the, the uh, you know, L-V dot dot typing, but... I think that was kind of an errant thing. I mean, maybe Maximon. I don't know much about this guy Maximon. Maybe he was, um, I don't know how close he was to Himmler, and I don't know about him otherwise, whether that was kind of a, a not-so-accurate um, description. But uh, I could definitely see some, some similarities to those historical figures, uh, which burning Jesuits and Robespierre. So, uh, what made him sinister to Karl Burkhardt, the former League of Nations High Commissioner of Danzig, was his capacity to concentrate upon little things, his pettifogging conscientiousness, and his inhuman methodology. He had a touch of the robot. Okay, so now I'm... Okay, screw V L E F. I'm going right back to 1L. Because, again... And particularly now, I'm already honing in on LVFE. The reason why is because the concentrate upon the little things. So he's he's detail oriented. He's cold and calculating. He's detail oriented, and he's very conscientious. And he has an, an, an inhuman methodology. He has a touch of the robot, right? One L, LF growing edge, which is growing edge uh, precision, right? His, his other negative, others negative positions, or you could say his, uh, his protective positions are logic and physics, which are the detail oriented, the, the temporal, the objective aspects. Okay. That's what they, logic and physics hold in common. Right. And yeah, that roboticness as we'll see, I'll, I'll continue reading. I won't say much more about that. But to me, right off the bat, within the first paragraph of this, I'm already typing in LVFA. Um, to his young daughter, uh, Gudrun, he was a loving father. Whatever is said about my poppy, she recently said, what has been written or shall be written in the future about him, he was my father, the best father I could have, and I love him and still love him. So, you know, I don't... Yeah, I, I obviously a daughter um, is going to be biased, okay? But that that kind of further buttress that, because I mean, all right, I don't think LVFEs are necessarily like the best dads or something like that. But the picture it's painting is of a guy who's in his his business of state. He's very cold and calculating, but to people around him, he's actually like kind of a friendly, honorable, and diplomatic guy, right? He's reasonable, and he he has a good family life. That that again paints a, paints me a portrait of the of a cliche LVFE. Um, most of his subordinates regarded Himmler as a warm, thoughtful employer with a deep sense of democracy. <laughs> okay, yeah, he's 2V. Uh, he played scat with secretaries and soccer. I don't know what scat is. It might be a card game. With secretaries and soccer with aides and uh, um, adjutants. So to me, that's showing that he, he, breaks, he breaks ranks with subordinates, right? That's, that's to me a sign of 2V. Uh, once he invited a dozen young... Um, Ch uh, charwoman to his birthday dinner and ordered his reluctant officers to choose them as table companions, then himself led off with the head charwoman. So basically with that paragraph, he's, he was democratic. He was, he was egalitarian. He, he 
was kind and reasonable to his subordinates. He was not like an overlord, personally. Okay? 2V. The key to this enig enigmatic character did not lie in his youth. He came from a well-to-do Bavarian middle-class family and was named after, after his father's most famous pupil, Prince Heinrich von Wittelsbach, who I think was like the Prince of Aus, or I'm sorry, the Prince of Bavaria um, of Southern Germany. Young Himmler was neither more nor less anti-Semitic anti than the average young Bavarian of his class, and the remarks about Jews in his diary were those of a bigot trying to be fair rather than of a racist. So when he was a young person, he came across less as a, a kind of unhinged racist um, who was like not only taking the existing um, anti-Semitism of the time and amplifying it, he was actually kind of, um, he was like, well, yes, it's, it's reasonable to hate the Jews and to dislike them, but let, let me be fair in my assessment. Again, that, I mean, that's 2V. That's 1L2V. Um, it's that even against people you consider enemies, you still try to be, you still try to walk it back and be fair and reasonable. He had a, he had rigid convictions concerning sex, and these were not unusual for his day, but still noteworthy. Okay. That, that I mean, to me, that's like 3F, 1L3F. In short, he seemed to be the predictable product of the Bavarian education and training, a promising young bureaucrat, meticulous and regulated. Remember, LF Growing Edge, detail-oriented. Uh, by 1922, at age uh, 22, Himmler was a typical young nationalist with anti-Semitic leanings and a romantic vision of military life. That year, he wrote a poem on the flyleaf of his diary, which revealed his dreams of dying for a cause. Although they may pierce you, fight, resist, stand by. You yourself may perish, but keep the banner high. So, yeah, I, I mean... That that could be anything. I see a little bit of strong, um, you know, higher will there. Um, you know, maybe some. Yeah, it could. I mean, I would just say probably higher will, one or two will. Uh, it was not strange that a young man of such bent should be attracted by the theories of national socialism, and its charismatic leader, a bureaucrat by training and loyal by nature, he was a perfect Nazi career man. Okay. As he rose, and that right there, loyal by nature, and some the way he acted later on, maybe you could say four V for that. It's possible, although, um, I, I I I don't know. I feel in general I get a two V vibe more from him, just because he was he was known like all his, the people, writing about him were just like you know very diplomatic, reasonable, um, deep sense of democracy. It's all, it seems very 2V to me. Um, as he rose in the party, he became the victim of a battle raging within himself. He was a Bavarian, yet fervently admired Prussian kings like Frederick, Frederick the Great and constantly praised Prussian austerity and hardness. Okay. Interesting. So he liked the Prussian austerity and hardness. Okay. That, that sounds like the dogmatist, right? The 1L coming through a little bit. Um, himself dark, meaning of complexion, like he wasn't a, he wasn't blonde haired, blue eyed, um, of average size and somewhat oriental features. And uh, what, the, what John Tallon means by that is just more kind of like Slavic, more step like in his appearance, maybe, um, you know, he had kind of like, a, a, you know, thinner eyes, you could say, um, not, he wasn't really Nordic. Um, uh, somewhat oriental features he believed fanatically that the ideal German was Nordic and like his master preferred to surround himself with tall, blonde, blue-eyed uh, subordinates he admired so okay uh, right from there I'm thinking 3F again because he's essentially you know he feels himself there's some weakness of physics there and that that will be um, echoed more in a moment and later on, but he, uh, you know, he has this kind of, as Afanasiev would say, the eros, the technically it's the false love 
towards the the beautiful perfect body right it's the three f's kind of hypocritical or contradictory obsession with you know bodily perfection right and i noticed before how it said that he was kind of prudish about sex and I, in fact i also i should mention that i um watched a hour long or so biography of him on youtube um to, to kind of like fortify um my uh understanding of him um and yeah it, it just corroborated exactly what john Tallon said um and it really kind of paints a picture of a of a 3f um individual um, he admired physical perfection as well as athletic skill, yet was constantly suffering from stomach cramps. Um, and that also, I don't think the book mentions this, but in the uh, little kind of biography video, um, it talks about as a child, he was plagued by sort of hypochondriacal um, fears of illnesses, and that very much frustrated him. He was constantly frustrated by um, little illnesses, okay? And we don't know if those were real or imagined, but again, that kind of fortifies my view of him being 3F. Um, he presented a ridiculous figure on skis or in the water and once collapsed trying to win a lowly bronze medal in the mile run. Hmm. Uh, with more personal power than anyone in the Reich except Hitler, he remained unpretentious and conscientious. So that's, to me, that's 2V or 4V. Um, born and, and definitely not 3V. Uh, born and bred a Catholic, he now relentlessly attacked the church, and yet, according to a close associate, con con uh, conscientiously rebuilt the SS on Jesuit principles by assiduously copying the service statutes and spiritual exercises presented by Ignatius Loyola. Um, so he was, he was, in the beginning, a very fervent Catholic, yet later on became like pagan, essentially, a pagan revivalist. Um, but he modeled the SS on Catholic organizations like the Jesuits. Uh, dreaded by millions, um, he trembled before the fewer who, he confessed to a subordinate, made him feel like a schoolboy who hadn't done his homework. All right, let's stop right there. Now, what type do people say that Hitler is? Of V E L F. I mean, Apanasio says that. Rob says that. And you know, I don't. I don't know. I have some thoughts about that. Maybe Hitler being three F. Um, but let's say he's V E L F. It does make sense given that V E L F would be um, one of the two uh, suffocation type relations to the L V F E. In fact, it's the superior of the relation, with the inferior being F L E V. So it would make sense that he would feel suffocated by Hitler um, in a peculiar way, okay? Uh, made him feel like a schoolboy who hadn't done his homework. Um, now that, that in itself could, um, you know, that could be interpreted other ways too. I mean, it could be, you know, potentially weak logic on Himmler's part and maybe stronger logic on uh, Hitler's part. Um, but I think that, um, I think that mostly that makes me think of the suffocation relation. Um, although I'm not, per I'm not set on Hitler being VELF, but interesting there. Uh, like his Fuhrer, Himmler was indifferent to things material and unlike Goering, Goering and others never profited from his position. So that, okay, and, and he lived in frugal simplicity, eating moderately, drinking sparingly, and restricting himself to two cigars a day. Um, that in itself could be 4F. Um, because, again, was indifferent to things material. I mean, that's literally indifferent to physics. And he says, like Hitler, okay? So that could be they're both 4F. Um Possibly, although it does seem that he seems very detail oriented, but um, in other ways, so it's kind of strange that there's a there's a kind of a contradiction here. But that could point towards 4F, so that's something that's a, a hanging chad there. Um, 
but then again, eating like eating moderately, drinking sparingly, restricting himself to two cigars a day, that could also be 3F, you know, maybe kind of a worrying about physics. And I think, you know, his hypochondria um, earlier in his life does does smack a bit of 3F more than 4F. But then again, Hitler was also like that. So uh, he maintained one household on the uh, Tegernessi, Tegernsi, the Tegernsi River. Uh, okay, he maintained one household on the Tegernsi uh, for his wife and daughter. Another near the Koenigsee for his personal secretary Hedwig Bot, uh, Pothast, who bore him a son and a daughter. Okay, um, so I guess he had an affair with her, um, and. As a man of responsibility, he provided for each family in a style which left him very little for his personal use. So, could be 4F there. I'm not sure. Um, some of his tenets were so eccentric that even his faithful followers found them difficult to accept. Glacial cosmogony, um, magnetism, uh, homeopathy, mesmerism, natural eugenics clairvoyance, faith healing, and sorcery. He sponsored experiments in obtaining gasoline by having water run over coal and in producing gold out of base metals. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Um, that, to me, could be anything. I mean, I don't know. that. I don't know if that in and of itself is type-related. Um having like eccentric spiritual beliefs. I mean, it, it could be, I mean, it could be any type. It just depends how he approached it, I guess. Um, but yeah, I'm not, not sure. Um, he seems very logical and like calculating. Um, so I don't, I don't think this necessarily means he isn't logical. Um, or he's not like a, a 1L or 2L. Um, I've, I mean, I know a bunch of 1Ls and 2Ls who are interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, so, I don't know. Doesn't I don't know if that's type related. Um, while his power had all come from Hitler, the fewer wanted nothing to do with him personally. Um, I need such policemen, he told Schaub, um, who had been entreated by Himmler to get him an invitation to the Berghof, but I don't like them. So he, and this is this was echoed in the video as well. Um, Hitler and Himmler um, had a good relationship up until the end. Okay, uh, towards the end, I should say. They had a good relationship, but it wasn't actually a personal relationship. In fact, they didn't really like each other a person in a personal way. Um, Himmler felt suffocated by. Hitler and Hitler, um, you know, he, he felt he was kind of, I guess, I don't know, like a, a police dog or something. Um, he didn't, he didn't like him personally. Okay. Hitler went so far as to order his personal, um, adjutant, uh, Schultz, an SS captain, uh, not to keep his nominal chief informed about the daily military discussions. So he he kind of didn't trust Himmler fully, although the video makes it sound like Hitler did trust Himmler. So I'm not sure who to believe. This was written in 19, you know, 76 or 72, whatever it said. Um, and maybe more has come to light since then, 76. Okay. At the same time, he put the Reichsfuhrer in ch full charge of the operation closest to his heart, the final solution. In some respects, it was an appropriate appointment. From the beginning, Himmler had been under Hitler's spell, and he remained totally Hitler's man, his disciple and subject. Furthermore, Himmler was the epitome of National Socialism, for it was as a diligent professional party worker that Himmler had overcome his own problems of identity. He was the Fuhrer's faithful right hand who, despite squeamishness in the face of blood or beatings, had become a mass killer by remote control, an efficient businessman murderer. 
so yeah, that was something. Um, there's a story of him having to per personally witness the execution of, um, I can't remember if it was Jews or prisoners of war, and uh, Himmler was quite squ squeamish. Um, he, he actually did not like um, seeing blood or beatings. So to me, that seems more 3F. It doesn't seem as 4F that he was squeamish, and instead he wanted to, he created this operation of ruthless efficient efficiency from remote you know remote control and to me that seems like you know something an lvfe would do you know the conductor right an efficient businessman murderer that's i think that's <laughs> the way an lvfe is uh you know evil uh he had done so while retaining his sentimentality i've often bagged a deer he confided to his personal physician but I must tell you, I've had a bad conscience each time I've looked into his dead eyes. Recently, at some personal risk, he had connived with Field Marshal Milch to save the lives of 14,000 Jewish skilled laborers in Holland. Um, he had also released from Ravensbrück concentration camp the mother of a Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe colonel who refused to renounce her beliefs as a Jehovah's Witness. He did so under Milch's threat never to speak to him again. He so wanted to be considered a good fellow. So he was... Um, he wanted, A, to be a good fellow. He wanted he wanted to be good. We're, you, know, you know, obviously people think of him as a very evil person, but, you know, it seems ideological not out of like a malice per se, but he really wanted to do good. And in fact, he kind of had a, at times he, he showed mercy. Um, and, but not, not all, all times, but sometimes he did. And he, uh, you know, he was kind of queasy in the face of, of violence. He actually didn't really like seeing violence or gore. Um, it, this, it made him, you know, anxious and stomach sick so seems kind of 3f and 2v still to me uh it approached dip diplomatically uh if, sorry if approached diplomatically he found it difficult to resist a reasonable plea for mercy seems kind of 2v to me um but it could be you know it's not it's not only 2v types that would you know if approached diplomatically resist you know would find it difficult to resist a reasonable plea for mercy, but it's noteworthy that this is echoed by multiple people as kind of a defining characteristic of him, that he was kind of a reasonable person. Um, in one case, he freed a deserter, in another forgave an official for writing a biting critique of SS treatment of the Poles. But his sense of honor forbade him to show mercy to his own flesh and blood. When a nephew, an, F an SS officer, was brought up on charges of homosexuality, he immediately signed the order sending him to a punishment camp. During imprisonment, the young man committed other homosexual acts, and the uncle ordered his execution. Uh, Rolf Wesser, an SS judge, urged leniency, but Himmler refused. I do not want anyone to say that I was more lenient because it was my own nephew. It was Hitler himself who had to revoke the judgment of death. So Hitler saved the Hitler saved his uh, Himmler's nephew's life um, ultimately, but Himmler was ready ready to go the whole way. And to me, this this seems like honestly one L and three F, because I think with the homosexuality, it's the fear of the deficiency of one's own genes. Like his his nephew was homosexual, and this is part of the SS. The whole thing with the SS was, you know this desire to create this like eugenic new like noble class basically um and you know himmler himself was not kind of of this ilk he wasn't like an aryan you know he wasn't a nordic uh blonde haired blue-eyed individual um and then you have his nephew who's in the ss but he turns out to be a homosexual and then Himmler is kind of dogmatically in, insisting on, um, you know, punishment and not 
not allowing his position to to get in the way of that. So to me, I, I see honestly, uh, this seems to me to be LVFV. It's like the the indifference to emotion, the forcing yourself to be honorable and to kind of like you know uh, to kind of um, not use your position um, for personal gain. Like you're not a an exception, you know. Um, so that seems like, that seems like 2V to me and also the kind of dogmatic insistence on it and the, um, the insecurity of physics, the deficiency of his, you know, part the SS became kind of his project to maybe compensate, overcompensate for his deficiency of physics that he felt within himself. And then his nephew was kind of, you know, and a glaring example of that deficiency remaining within the very organization that he was trying to build up. He didn't create the SS, but he was obsessed with with building it up. So yeah, I, I, I see LVFE here. Um, under Himmler's supervision, the work of the killing centers reached the peak of efficiency by the fall of 1943. At Auschwitz, those selected for death marched to the gas chambers, unaware of their fate, past an inmate symphony orchestra conducted by the Jewish, Jewish violinist um, Alma Rose. At Treblinka, however, the Jews almost always knew they were about to die and would cry and laugh from shock. Annoyed guards lashed away at them. Babies who hindered attendance while shaving their mother's hair would be smashed against a wall. If there was any resistance, guards and capos, the trustees, um, would use whips to drive the naked victims into trucks bound for the gas chamber. Uh, the thought of refusing the order to murder never entered the heads of the executioners. I can only say, yeah, wool. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, wool. Okay. Um, Haas. Yeah, I don't know if it's Haas or Haas. Um, I, I don't know German, so... The commandant of Auschwitz later confessed. It didn't occur to me at all that I would be held responsible. You see, in Germany, it was understood that if something went wrong, then the man who gave the orders was, was responsible. Nor did these executioners ever question whether the Jews deserved their fate. Don't you see? We SS men were not supposed to think about these things. It never even occurred to us. At the top. We were also trained to obey orders without even thinking. But the thought of disobeying an order would simply never have occurred to anybody and somebody else would have done it just as well if I had it. Besides, those who participated in the exterminations had been trained so rigorously that one would shoot his own brother if ordered to. Orders were everything. Some of the executioners thoroughly enjoyed their work, but these were sadistic at the peril of punishment from their chief. Um, so, punishment from Himmler. He didn't, he didn't like sadistic. Uh, he didn't like the sadism of it. He just wanted efficient murder, basically, but he didn't like sadism. Uh, years earlier, Himmler had forbidden independent action against the Jews by any member of his organization. The SS commander must be hard, but not hardened, he instructed one um, St Sturm von Fuhr. If during your work you come across cases in which some commander exceeds his duty or shows, um, or shows signs that his restraint is becoming blurred, intervene at once. Recently, he had passed down a similar judgment to the SS legal department in regard to unauthorized shootings of Jews. If the motive is selfish, sadistic, or sexual, judicial punishment should be imposed for murder or manslaughter, as the case may be. That was undoubtedly why he had authorized Morgan uh, to bring the commandant of Buchenwald to trial. So that's, to me, again, kind of smacks of LVFE, you know, um, well, at least 2V. And it also, it kind of reminds me of the show, um, oh, what is it called? Squid Game, right? <clears throat> the Korean uh, Netflix series. Or was it? Uh, it might not have been Netflix sponsored, but it was on Netflix. Um, yeah, and kind of that that very efficient, um, you know, that inf efficient environment that was created where there's like death and murder, but it's like weirdly um, democratic and the host and the front man um, who kind of govern the, the squid game 
um, institution organization. Um, they're very obsessed with like cleanliness, efficiency, preserving the principle and honor of the game, um, and not allowing employees or rogue participants to kind of sully that fairness of the game and also um, not allowing them to cheat. So, and that's kind of the vibe that this gives off to me is that like commitment to sort of this efficient, you know, fair, allegedly, but brutal um, operation. Training his men to become hard but not hardened was a difficult task for Himmler, and he attempted to do so by transforming the SS into the uh, into an order of knights with the motto, loyalty is my honor. Um, so what does Afanasiev call the uh, 2B types? Uh, noblemen, right? Uh, he imbued the SS, therefore, not only with a sense of racial superiority, but with the hard virtues of loyalty, comradeship, duty, truth, diligence, honesty, and knighthood. His SS as the elite of the party was the elite of the German Volk and therefore the elite of the entire world, by establishing castles of the order to indoctrinate SS members in his ideals. Indoctrinate them in his ideals, L LV. He hoped to breed a new man, <laughs> far finer and more valuable than the world, had, the world had yet seen. He also lectured his men on good manners and good breeding. Uh, again, I'm seeing a lot of 2V and 3F in here. Whether it is a dinner you are giving or the organization of a march, wherever there are guests, I insist that you intend to the slightest details, for I want the SS to set an example of propriety everywhere and show the utmost courtesy and consideration to all fellow Germans. His SS men were to be models of neatness. I do not want to see a single white vest with the slightest spot of dirt. Uh, 3F. Furthermore, they must drink like gentlemen, or you will be sent a pistol and asked to put an end to it. Oof. That's just, like, cool, in my opinion. But could be 3F, could be 2V. Uh, with a little bit of 4E there. Uh, they were to be gentlemen, in fact, no matter how atrocious their mission. And with this in mind, Himmler summoned his, summoned his SS generals to Posen on October 4th, 1943. His primary purpose was to enlarge the circle of those privy to the extermination of the Jews. The recent revelations by Morgan, combined with persistent rumors of terrors in the concentration camps, were causing apprehension and some revulsion among the most loyal, loyal adherents of the Fuhrer. Now that the truth was leaking out, he had decided to involve the party and the military in his final solution. By making them, in effect, co-conspirators, he would force them to fight on to the end. The war was probably lost, but this would give him time to fulfill his main ambition. If worse came to worst, he would take millions of Jews to death with him. Man, I don't even know what that is, but <clears throat> pretty serious stuff. Uh, the speech to the SS officers were, was not only the first in a series of information lectures by Himmler that were to include many civilian leaders and Wehr, uh, Wehrmacht uh, officers. Wehrmacht officers, sorry. Um, in a sense, the first was the most important of the scheduled speeches since he must convince the SS that the execution of this distasteful deed was not at variance with the highest principles of their order. He said he wanted to talk to them quite frankly on a very grave matter. Among ourselves, it should be mentioned once quite openly, but we will never speak of it publicly. His reluctance to proceed was obvious, but finally he said, I mean the evacuation of the Jews, the extermination of the Jewish race. It is one of those things it is easy to talk about. The Jewish race, race is being exterminated, says one party member. That's quite clear. It's in our program. Elimination of the Jews. And we're doing it. Exterminating them. These plain words, after years of rhetoric and sloganeering, were shocking despite the unwelcome suspicions raised by Morgan and Kurt Gerstein. More so was Himmler's condemnation of those who had been profiting by the final solution. A number of SS men, there are not very many of them, have fallen short and they will die without mercy. We had the moral right, we had the duty of our people to destroy this race which wanted to destroy us. 
but we have not the right to enrich ourselves with so much as a fur, a watch, a mark, or a cigarette, or anything else. Because we have exterminated a bacterium, we do not want to be, we do not want to be eventually infected by the bacterium or die of it. I will not allow so much as a sepsis to appear here and, or gain a hold. Wherever it may form, we must cauterize it. Uh, in the final analysis, however, we can say that we have fulfilled this most difficult duty for the love of our people, and our spirit, our soul, our character have not suffered injury from it. I'm seeing a lot of 3F there, okay? I mean, if you look at this, the analogy he, or the metaphor he's using, um, you know, it's like a, a disease, a disease of um, ignobility and kind of unfairness. It's like the disease of um, it, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just seeing, I'm seeing 2B and 3F here because it's like he, he needs to, they want to exterminate the Jews, but it's not for personal riches. Um, it's not, um, it's not out of some sort of profiteering or kleptocratic desire. It's out of their ideology, out of Himmler's ideology, right? But he's very wary of letting his men be corrupted by basically self-interested physics, which would be more of like 1F. Like Afanasiev says that um, 1F types tend towards like capitalism and private ownership. And when they're in a system of collective ownership, they tend towards kleptocracy and corruption and black markets. Um, and I could kind of see that for one Fs. I mean, I think it's a little, it's a little, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a little strong. I don't know if it, that's always a situation, but I can kind of see it. And I can kind of see here the opposite where it's like, no, he's doing it for the, the, you know, his ideology, which he believes is like noble and it's about virtue and he wants the SS to remain pure and not sully, not, um, diseased with this kind of selfish desire for material possessions, right? Uh, two days later, Himmler spoke in the same vein to a group of uh, Galliters and Reichs Reichsleiters. The sentence, the Jews must be exterminated, with its few words, gentlemen, can be uttered easily. But what that sentence demands of the man who must execute it is the hardest and toughest thing in existence. It was apparent to his listeners that they were about to hear what they had been closing their ears to for months. I ask you really only to hear and never to talk about what I tell you in this circle. When the question arose, what should be done with the women and children? I decided here also to adopt a clear solution. I did not deem myself justified in exterminating the men, that is to say, to kill them or let them be killed, while allowing their children to grow up to avenge themselves on our sons and grandchildren. The hard decision had to be taken. This people must disappear from the face of the earth. Yeah, so pretty brutal. Maybe, I don't know, it, that could be any type, potentially. Um, I see kind of the, you know, the bad side of 1L and 4E, okay? Uh, this was, he said, the most onerous assignment the SS ever had. It was carried out, I think, I think I can say, without our men and our leaders suffering the slightest damage to spirit or soul. They had remained knights despite mass extermination. A leaden silence fell over the hall. He spoke, recalled Balder von Sch Chirac, with such icy coldness of the extermination of men, women, and children, as a businessman speaks of his balance sheet. There was nothing emotional in his speech, nothing that suggested an inner involvement. To me, that seems 4E. It seems 1L and 4E. Okay? Because he's really, I don't really get from this excerpt nor the video I watched any suggestion that he was really, like, kind of, you know, tormented by emotions. He just seemed kind of indifferent, um, business like. All right? Uh, yeah, I just, I can't help but see, but see, uh, LVFE here. Um, 
After enlarging on the difficulties of this awesome task, Himmler brought the subject to a close. You now know what is, oh, sorry, you now know what is, what, you now know what is what, and you must keep it to yourself. Perhaps at a much later time, we shall consider whether something about it can be told to the German people. But it is probably better to bear the responsibility on behalf of our people, a responsibility for the deed as well as for the idea, and take the secret with us into our graves. He was like Brutus, forcing his colleagues to dip their hands in Caesar's blood. The final solution was no longer the burden only of Hitler and Himmler, but theirs, a burden they must carry in silence. Could be 2B. Could kind of be like a, you know, a shitty thing that a 2B would do, kind of like implicating others, um, you know. And he says, he said, the author says uh, he was like Brutus, right? Um, so, yeah, that... <clears throat> Yeah, it seems it seems kind of second volition to me. Um, I don't know if I can really articulate it why exactly um, at the moment, but maybe I don't know. If you if you know, you know. If you if you're picking up on it, then fair enough. If not, you can just ignore my comment there. Um, Borman closed the meeting with an invitation to lunch in the adjoining hall. During the meal, uh, Sh Shirak Shirak. And the other Gaul leaders um, and Reich's leaders wordlessly avoided each other's eyes. Most guessed that Himmler had only revealed the truth so as to make them accomplices, and that evening they drank so much that a good number had to be helped into the train that was taking them to the uh, Wolfschanze. Wolfschanze. Albert Speer, who had addressed the same audience just before Himmler, was so disgusted by the drunken spectacle that the next day he urged Hitler to read his party leaders a lecture on temperance. So that's it for that that section. Um, and also, I remembered that in the video I watched, it said that like as as a young man, um, as as a boy, really, he, he Himmler kept a diary. Okay, and that that wasn't unusual at the time. But what was unusual about his diary? <laughs> Is that he wouldn't, he wouldn't really like write his his thoughts in it. He would just kind of make a very dry list of what happened, like just items of the day of what happened. Um, he would also refer to adults in his diaries by their full name, or just people in general. He would refer to by their full name every time. Um, it seems kind of yeah, like autistic. But the thing is. I in fact do something similar, um, and it was it was like the meticulousness of his diary, like writing like what he ate and how much time he spent and all this kind of stuff, very like meticulous and calculating. Um, and I actually do something similar, although I started much later in my life. But I keep like an Excel sheet with you know it's broken up into thirty minute increments, and I color code each cell based on the day. And I've been doing this for. I think since 2018. Um, and I also uh, will write like very dryly, matter of factly, like, oh, went to Walmart today, you know. Um, so I kind of relate to this. It's just, you know, I, I don't know what it is. It's that like kind of obsession with like details and tracking, meticulousness, um, probably related to like LF growing edge, meaning, um, you know, 1L and 3F. Um, but yeah, and I, so I, he, he kind of was the same thing. So that was another similar similarity I noticed. And I think if we, you know, obviously the whole video is kind of, or this whole video that I'm making now, this recording is kind of amusing just because like, you know, he's allegedly one of the worst human beings that, you know, ever existed. Right. He's like the architect of the Holocaust. Um, but the point isn't isn't so much about the history. It's more about the the type of personality, um, and I think if you kind of abstract away the personality from historical matters, you know, you kind of get an image of a guy who's he wants to be the conductor behind the scenes. He wants to like run the big operation, and he's very. He's cold and businesslike. He's kind of indifferent emotionally. 
he's he's idealistic though. He's driven by ideals, right? Which I think is kind of two V and one L to some extent. Um, uh, he's you know he's dogmatic, but he's honorable, and he makes a good impression of like a reasonable and diplomatic man, despite his coldness. Like he he has that excessive excessive dogmatism and order that focus on order that one else have and he's noticeably like well like no emotions just indifferent although he does kind of show some emotion some squeamishness around you know blood and violence um and he shows some like insecurity related to like pain even the suffering of others too and prudishness about sex um Right, so it, you kind of, you get a picture of this sort of person. And I mean, really what his ideal is, is to create this superhuman race, the superhuman class or race of the future, right, through the SS. But they're not just, you know, you know, to him, right, not to the eyes of history thereafter, but to him, he was creating a race of noblemen, right, a race of, like, very courteous, upstanding people who are also like physically perfect right um whereas he himself was was not so physically perfect and he was kind of a hypochondriac hypochondriac right so all told i mean i i get a strong i get a strong sense of lvfa right but it's just this is the you know the dark side of lvfa right <clears throat> so yeah, I think that's all I have to say for now about Himmler, um, Heinrich Himmler, the the conductor of the Third Reich. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, pretty uh, pretty interesting stuff. I was just I'm getting I'm this biography of Hitler has taken so long for me to get through, but I saw this excerpt section and I was like, wow, that's like really striking to me. Um, so I just had to make a recording. So there's that.